My name is Peter Christensen. I'm going to speak about JavaScript for makers uh, using JavaScript and web programming in hardware, robotics, and electronics projects. Um, we can start out very basic. This is the world. It is real. It is full of people. They are also real. You can touch them. They exist. And all of these people have something in common, many things in common. But for the purpose of this talk, the thing that everybody has in common is that everybody wants to create something. It's an urge inside every person. Some people forget it as they grow older, but everyone, at least at some point in their life, was a kid and wanted to make something. Many of you here still have that urge. Um, this can be anything from art, sports, family, politics, engineering. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? A big, giant robot that digs tunnels under the ocean. This was for the channel. Um, or fashion, there are any number of creative fields. But we are all here because we love software. But there's something different about software compared to all those real things and tangible things and touchable things that uh, we saw pictures of. Um, and there's the things that you know and you work with. There's, but below the surface, something about creation in software development is qualitatively different than creation in other fields. And without knowing anything else about it, you can see that people, among other things, have become fabulously wealthy writing software. There are not a lot of pottery billionaires that I know. <laughs> Uh, not a lot of people uh, dig tunnels, but billions of people, or a billion people-ish, are on Facebook. Uh, it's, it's different. Software is made up of bits. It's an encoding of information that we can transfer around very cheaply, practically free. Because software is just information, it's very easy to reproduce. This is your software factory on the left. This is a real factory or strip mine or something large and expensive and dirty and awful on the right side. And I'm sure that whatever comes out of that dirty, awful, expensive factory is very useful to us. Maybe it's parts for the computers that run our software. I don't know. But it is far more complicated and less elegant than the software factory on the left. Software has a very shallow learning curve. It goes on forever, but you can get started very easily. The hello world of software is much easier than the hello world of surgery. <laughs> it's also much easier to find an audience for the former. <laughs> software is very easy and inexpensive to distribute, uh, especially so now with the web and with app stores, but even, even when all you, even when you had to ship a box with a CD in it that was much easier than uh, having trucking and freight and ports with 200 foot high cranes and warehouses, um, car dealerships and lots. Those things are all expensive and they consume space and time and energy that software just does not have to deal with. Um, I was giving a similar talk to this a few months ago and I had forgotten that I got a new laptop and I didn't have the keynote presentation software on it. So while I was in a hotel, I went to the app store and I purchased it and downloaded it and 10 minutes later I had software on my computer. It was amazing. I did not have to use a port. At least not that kind of port. Um, software has a huge variety of tools and libraries that let us abstract away non-core tasks. We can focus on the specific problem that we're trying to solve instead of where the machines are that's going to run or how many of those machines there should be or how they're configured or how to send email in large numbers or how to monitor what's going on. We have all these different resources available to take away the parts of a software project where we don't add value so that we can focus on the specific parts where we do. 
And much of software development comes from tools that have been written by communities that freely contribute uh, software and that people have written and shared with the world rather than selling. It's pretty astonishing how much of the internet and the software economy runs on open source software, free software. You know, if you compare this to like automobile manufacturing, you know, it's, it's not that there's any, it's not that there's a ideological difference, but it's just not possible to have open source like steel. <laughs> I can't give you steel without mining steel and making steel and all that. That goes back to the factory from earlier. And this is the world that we live in. This is a, the internet or some representation of the interconnectedness of the nodes of the internet. Um, you can't touch this, sort of. Um, sure, there are routers and there are fiber optic cables and servers everywhere, but that's not what you experience when you experience the internet. These are the, the guts and the organs, but they're not the experience. Um, and the internet started as a text-based protocol for sending text back and forth between different computers. And that has since been overloaded and extended to provide images, um, documents, and entire applications. And that's made browsers richer and more powerful. So we've done amazing things with just the internet. But and it, the software and the internet covers our professions or passions, or for many of us, both. And even with those limitations of text-based transfer, information-based transfer to computer screens, we've created wonderful uh, and immeasurable amounts of knowledge, communities, entertainment, wealth, and more. But what if the user interface extended beyond the browser, beyond the screen, beyond the glass? Uh, people talk about computing going into the real world now that everybody has a smartphone in their pocket and a tablet and all that, but it's still information showed to you on a piece of glass. The place where, if you want to see where software and the real world intersect is called Maker Fair. How many people have been to any of the Maker Fair events? They are totally awesome. They're completely crazy. Uh, I went for the first time this year and it I think I saw maybe 5% of the stuff and probably saw a couple dozen things that blew my mind completely that they even existed and people spent measurable amounts of time and energy and effort to pour their heart and soul into these things. Here are just a couple uh, videos to give a representation of what you might see at Maker Faire. These are simple robotic bugs. They work by um, changing direction when one or both of the antennas are pressed and they cost like nine dollars worth of parts and a kid can assemble them and they look like bugs and they're cool and gross. That's also my daughter with the bunny ears on. <laughs> this was a visualization where there was music playing. Uh, yeah. Music's not important for this. but. Music playing, people dancing, there was a webcam on them, there was a OpenCV um, data parsing and visualization translating the, the uh, visual images of people moving into these um, pixel base and there were a bunch of different um, visualizations of people's movement in front of them. And this is my favorite. This was a car with hundreds of fish and lobsters attached to it and they are singing uh, the Hallelujah Chorus. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, it was the whole song. It went on for a long time. Um, so these things are all atoms. They're not just bits. They have information encoded in them, but they're in the real world. And so this is a, a sample of what kind of things can happen when uh, software intelligence meets hardware in the real world. It's the cat picture of the real world, if you will. 
Um, software enables intelligent interaction with abstract things, data, forms, information. Hardware enables intelligent interaction with physical things. The good news is that hardware is becoming software. Uh, Paul Graham, who is the founder of Y Combinator, which invests in and supports a whole lot of companies, said that, well, he said that, as people love hardware, people love to make it, people love to buy it, and the easier it gets to build hardware, the more hardware companies you'll see. And just an example of how customers love to buy it, you might think people don't like to buy anything because it costs money. Um, this is a robot ball called a Sphero. It has motors in it, it has lights, it's controlled with Bluetooth, I'll play with it more later. Uh, this was $130, and I was trying to think of any software company that I'd spent 130, that I'd paid $130 to in less than a year, let's say, and there were not very many. But I was very happy to buy this because it's a magical robot ball. <laughs> it doesn't need to be more than that. Um, and the benefits that we enjoy in hardware, I mean in, in developing software, are now beginning to uh, exist for the development of hardware as well. Uh, manufacturing is getting cheaper, uh, both for small batch uh, hardware manufacturing in America, as well as, especially if you do large manufacturing runs in China, it can be very, very, very inexpensive. Uh, once you have put all the work and effort into the design, the, the cost of manufacturing is going down, especially as your scale goes up. Um, there's a broader base of participation. You saw the videos from Maker Faire. There were thousands of people there, and there are hundreds of Maker Faire events around the world every year. Uh, as far as funding and distribution, um, Kickstarter and Indiegogo and other crowdfunding sites are providing a lot of the funding and enabling benefits that venture capital and angel investors have done for software development. Uh, the more hardware development that goes on, the more hardware components that are getting developed, and that serves a lot of the same purpose as things like Heroku and Amazon Web Services and Mailgun and those other um, services I showed earlier. Before, if you wanted to put wireless uh, features on a, on a small um, electronics project, you had to know a lot about radios and antennas and communication over the wire through those. Uh, but now you can buy circuit boards with built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth that are very easy to connect to, that are always on, that use low power. That you don't have to figure that stuff out anymore. And the more of the basic tasks that are solved by products that people develop, the more you can focus on your own creative uh, implementation of hardware as opposed to uh, spending all your time doing the basic table stakes kind of work. And community. There are meetups, there are support groups, there are um, conferences for hardware development, for hardware hackers, tinkerers, there's Maker Faire, there's other things that I'll talk about more later. Uh, but their community of hardware developers is just as strong and growing like it is in software. And here are some examples of the inputs and fruits of hardware development. The top left is an arcade kit that you can put together using 3D printed acrylic, off the shelf buttons and joysticks, and a Raspberry Pi, which is a little computer. Uh, you can build your own arcade. There's a 3D printer. There's um, Okay, good. The, the thing in the middle is uh, a site called Upverter that lets you design circuits and collaborate on electronic circuit diagrams like you can do with GitHub for software. Uh, and on the bottom, there are some educational tools. The dollhouse thing is called Ruminate, and it's um, walls and pieces and, and things that snap together so that kids can build their own dollhouses and decorate them. There's also electronic parts for lights and fans and things like that. And on the right, bottom right, those are, that's, I forgot what that's called, but it's a new thing that that's just came out this summer where there are electronic components, but instead of wiring them together, they connect together with magnets 
and the phone shell around it is an augmented reality app that lets you point your, uh, that lets you take a picture of the circuit that you designed using these components and it will either show the, the circuit working or if there's a problem, say you have a piece on backwards, it will show that that is in backwards and show you how to correct it. So there's tools to learn electronics as well as build with them. The white one, that's called uh, Upverter. It's for designing software or designing electronic circuit boards. And please don't, don't write all this stuff down. I'm going to post links to everything afterwards. I'm covering a ton of stuff because I'd rather show the, the breadth of everything that's available and let you choose where to dive in than teach you how to do any, any specific thing in this. So you're probably listening to me talking and thinking that I've been dealing with electronics and circuits forever and that I'm a pro at this. So not the case. Um, you know those kids that took things apart when they and, and would sometimes put them together and sometimes not? I was always afraid that if I, wouldn't, if I couldn't put it back together, I'd get in trouble. So I just didn't take stuff apart and left it working. Um, the hardest classes for me were the, in college were the electrical and L, yeah, I can't even say the word. <laughs> electrical engineering classes. My tongue's tied, my brain's tied. Um, but I've been seeing the way hardware has developed and have the new features and resources that are available. And when I moved out to the Bay Area last year, I was looking for interesting projects and people to get involved with. And I came across the OpenROV project. OpenROV is a submersible robot about the size of a shoebox that you control from your web browser. And this is swimming around at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. And it was founded by two guys who had this crazy idea where they had heard a, a tall tale of a cave up in the mountains in Northern California where a bank robber had stashed his stolen gold in this underwater cave and nobody was ever able to find it or retrieve it. And they thought, you know what? We know uh, electronics, we know m mechanical engineering. We could make a robot submarine that could do this. And it took them two and a half years of work to get to the point where it, they could actually pilot it and where they went back and tried and didn't find the coal. Um, <laughs> but they found something better. They found this project that they could work on and explore uh, different tools and techniques for building and, and developing things. They created a worldwide community of contributors who have all chipped into the hardware or software or mechanical design or testing or any, any of those things. And they're now, they raise money and they're selling these kits. They, they had a very successful Kickstarter project. And this is what they do for a living now is robot submarines. And I was just completely fascinated by it. And I still am. And I met them and I talked to them and I looked at their software and they had some contributions from other people for software, but at heart they were mechanical and electrical engineers and rapid prototypers. But they have a, um, a BeagleBone, which is a small computer chip that runs Linux on it. That's the brains inside the submarine. And here's the interface where you control it. You see through the video camera at the front with the ROVCs, there's heads up displays for which direction you're, you're uh, tilted and angled and sensor readings on the right. And through getting to know these guys and the project that they worked on and having them throw around terms like I squared C and other electronic things that I still, I can't keep up with the discussion, but it really got me excited about the potential for normal people with hobbyist um, budgets to make amazing things. Then a few months later, I went to a hardware hackathon event and I met a guy named Jeff who was working on a project for an electronic uh, pick and place machine for assembling circuit boards. 
Um, circuit boards have lots of tiny little pieces. If you ever look at one, uh, they're not the kind of things you would want to place by hand. And so his, the machines that assemble them cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're very efficient, they work very quickly, but if something costs $100,000, there's a very limited number of people who can have it. And he said, well, with cheap hardware and good software, you could build one of these for a few thousand dollars and it would be the same as when printers became available beyond just massive printing houses. Um, desktop printing changed the way many, many industries were run and desktop level assembly of electronic components could do the same for hardware development and prototyping. And I worked with him at this hackathon and he kept on working on the project after that and we've continued working on it since and it's getting there. There's a lot of us involved. They're doing computer vision, hardware, electronics, software. Uh, it's a big project and it's a big goal, but it's just, it's the kind of exciting things that are going on in the world of hardware development now. So enough about me. How can you get started with hardware? Um, if you take nothing away from this talk, you should get the book Zero to Maker. This, this guy, David, is one of the guys from OpenROV, and he wrote this book where he went through all of his experiences. Uh, he was a business school grad, and he had a job working Excel spreadsheets, and he hated it, and he, his company failed, and he got fired, and he just, he didn't even care that he got fired because he hated his job. So he took his savings, and he came up to San Francisco, and he decided to take three months and see if he could learn how to gain skills used in um, making real things. And he went on this amazing journey through marinas and, and welding shops and blacksmiths and electronics and programming. And he got a great set of experience. This book is wonderful, not just for learning about making things, but for uh, pursuing lifelong learning. And again, if you do nothing else, from listening to me for an hour, buy this book. It is great. And I'm not just saying that because I'm friends with David. Um, the next step if you're doing software, is if you're a software developer looking to get into hardware is Arduino. And it is this small circuit board. Don't be fooled by the picture. It's really small. This is how big it is, larger than life size there. And it's very easy to program and it's very easy to uh, create prototype electronics with um, all the little ports on the top and bottom are places you can connect wires and create circuits. The code for it comes with a very simple IDE that takes care of compiling and loading and everything. You just download and run this one program. It's got a lot of example code already in, built in. Um, it's a simple programming language based on the processing programming language, if anyone knows that. Uh, compatible hardware comes in a variety of shapes and sizes, from the Pinocchio on the left, which is a new crowdfunded thing that has built-in mesh networking, to the standard ones, to the circular one on the far right is one specially designed for wearable computing. So you can sew it into your clothes and it doesn't snag fibers. And, and the one on the bottom was for very, very, very tiny uh, applications or cheap things. And I think it's like $8 for that, for a, a microcontroller that you can put logic and code and electronic connections into. If you want to move up a step beyond that or do more powerful applications, there's the Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone which this is a, a beagle bone. This is a full Linux computer with a gig of RAM, I think, a few gigs on a, on a flash drive. It's got a USB port, an ethernet cord, um, other things. You can run open, oh, I dropped a screw. It's falling apart. That's not an indictment of the product, um, <laughs> but you can do anything that you can do with a, a big 
expensive, heavy Linux computer on these, and they're about $40 each. So imagine if you could make a product that had a full uh, Linux computer and any software you wanted in it. And especially if you love JavaScript, there's a new board called the Tessel, and it has this board and a development environment or development tool chain and special um, adapter motors that let you write in JavaScript directly and then it compiles to something using magic and it goes on the <laughs> it goes on the processor uh, and if you go to their website you can see what happens if you press the button but it makes the servo spin. Um, it's if you know and love JavaScript and you're very familiar with it, this is another option for skipping a step in the knowledge that you have to gain in order to um, make hardware work. Um, this is this just had a successful crowdfunding campaign, and they're going to be shipping to the public in early next year. So this is probably expensive, right? I showed you a bunch of electronic circuits. Um, there's lots of parts, uh, but no, it's not really. I said the, the Arduino board costs $25 by itself. You can buy Arduino starter kits for about $100 that will have LEDs and wires and buttons and switches and resistors and sensors and motors, uh, everything you need to work through the you know, first 20 or 30 tutorials that are available in a variety of places. Um, and I said the, the Beagle Bone is $45, Raspberry Pi is like $40. Uh, they're very inexpensive to get started. If you have a laptop, and I see lots of glowing apples from here, you can afford to get started in electronics. <laughs> now, like any self-respecting nerdy hobby, you can go to infinity with the amount of money you spend on it, but you don't need to have infinity dollars to start out with. And another way to get started is to get involved. Find a product, whether it's like I did with OpenROV, or Pinocchio, or Tessel, or uh, any of the, just go to Kickstarter and look for successful hardware uh, crowdfunding projects. And the one thing that they all have in common is that there's so much work to do. And they might have a place where you can contribute to software needs that they have. Um, all of them need beta testers and beta users feedback on how these things work. They all really, really want demo projects of, with this hardware that it created, you can do X. Uh, they love that. They will, they, all these teams that I've had any contact with are just incredibly generous and excited about what they're doing and excited that you, you care about what they're doing. Um, they're very happy to help you. Um, some of them that have network components have um, APIs that you can build against. There's one called the Spark Core that has a, a REST controller built into, it has a server and a REST controller on it so you can program against it. And they have a remote control car that you can control over the internet. Uh, but the number one thing if you're interested in hardware is to goof around, do stuff, play with things, see if you can, you know, get a three color light, see if you can get it to change uh, all three colors, uh, see if you can make a, see if you can connect a website, a web page to a robot. See, just, I guarantee that in this room there is, what, probably 100 people, 150 people, there's probably 500 crazy ideas that you could come up with. Um, and one of them, or more, is crazy enough to be awesome. So here's a quick crash course on electronics from someone who knew no electronics a year ago. Very basic. Uh, electrons want to go from negative to positive. If there is no path for them to go through, the circuit stops. Um, you can put stuff in the middle of this flow of electrons to do things, either to um, have the electrons make it do something or to change the path of the electrons. And each component that you use is like a function that has input, inputs and outputs, and you can chain them together from the, inputs of, the outputs of one to the inputs of another, 
just like you can do with functions in jQuery, et cetera. Here are some of the components that you'll see, wires, batteries. Uh, on the left is the, the schematic symbol of what it'll look like if you're looking at someone else's design. On the right is what it looks like in real life. Um, lights, switches, resistors, and the magical breadboard on the right. It's just a bunch of holes with metal strips underneath them so that you can connect things together easily without having to solder wires or twist and untwist wires. Um, you just stick it in a row and it's connected. And this is what a very simple circuit for an Arduino to light up and blink an LED would look like. Uh, a wire going from the Arduino to the breadboard, the, the resistor to dim the light, going from the left side to the middle, the red light, and then connected back to the breadboard, or back to the Arduino board. Um, and on the right is what it looks like in real life. Um, if you're interested in learning this, uh, Adafruit, which is a manufacturer and reseller of electronic components, they have great, great, great tutorials and examples and idea pages. Uh, SparkFun also has this. There's tons of, tons of ways to learn. And this is very simple uh, Arduino code for turning on, to, for blinking a light. Uh, there, every Arduino program just has two required functions, a setup and a loop. <laughs> in the setup, in this case, you're saying that your pin is used for output. And then in the loop, you turn it on. You wait two seconds, you turn it off, you wait two seconds, and then you repeat, because it's a loop. And the way Arduinos work is they run the loop program until they lose power. And if you go beyond that, then you can do custom circuit design. Uh, there's a whole other set of skills needed for that. It is a pretty significant jump in, in uh, demands from you. But you can use something like Upverter or professional software like Eagle or um, others to design circuits. And then on the bottom left is what, or in the bottom right is what the circuit looks like before all the components are placed on it. That's just the board and the gold is the wires. And then the top right is a finished board. This one is something that the OpenROV project uses to connect the BeagleBone, which has the Linux um, Node.js server running on it to the Arduino that controls the motors and the sensors and the other hardware bits. So JavaScript turns out to be a surprisingly useful tool for development of hardware and electronics projects. Um, JavaScript's rise to new popularity happened more or less the same time as the maker movement and maker electronics really got underway. So a lot of people who were new to one were new to the other. Um, because of the social nature of making and sharing, uh, all of this stuff is going on the web, where JavaScript is a very important part. Um, a lot of these projects are made by people who are not engineers or not software developers at all. And so learning JavaScript means that they only have to learn one pro computer programming language instead of two or three to make the web component and the, the hardware component. And despite its charms and quirks and flaws, JavaScript is a very forgiving language for beginners, especially when you consider that the alternative for doing hardware development a lot of times is C and C++, which is less forgiving for beginners. Um, important libraries are node serial port, uh, basically anything that communicates over a wire or many things that communicate over a wire use a serial port, which is a sequence of bits in a row. Uh, this node serial port makes it easy to connect to and communicate over serial port, which lets you use lots of different hardware. Um, an alternative is something called Fermata, which is a protocol that is implemented on lots of different microcontroller boards. Uh, Arduino is the most popular, but there are quite a few others. But if you install uh, Fermata firmware on any board and write your JavaScript code against or your higher level code against Fermata protocol, then you can switch out hardware without requiring a lot of changes. Um, 
A really cool one that's come out over the last year or so is called Johnny Five. And what it does is it is libraries and wrappers around different hardware components that then will communicate via Fermata protocol to control hardware. So this is an example code where you create a button, eight is the port, or is the pin on your circuit board, and then you can create event handlers, log it when you, it's down, log it when you hold it, log it when it's up. Um, there's different, different code in there for servos, motors, lights, buttons, switches, um, many, many, many different kinds of components. And if, when people get new hardware that's not in there, it's very easy to write an adapter, a Johnny Five adapter for that hardware, and then you add it, and the, the, the library of things that can be controlled using Johnny Five is growing very fast. Um, here's an example of someone who had a, has a robot arm. There's a swivel at the base, and there's three, um, three joints in the arm, and he's sliding his finger back and forth through the different minimum and maximum uh, rotation or extension values and moving the, the hardware reacting to that. Um, it's, it's very easy to put a lot of smarts into robots now where it was very difficult before. Um, and there's an event called, or a community called NodeBots where you'll get together and there's big piles of electronic components of all sorts and you build stuff and you have fun. Uh, there's not a greater goal than that because who needs a greater goal than that? Um, I have to say that of all the software communities that I've been involved with, the people that are behind NodeBots are some of the most enthusiastic and eager and well-meaning and helpful and productive and inclusive and any other positive adjectives you can think of. Um, it's really, really amazing. So now that I've told you all of the other things about how to use electronics and program and use circuits and all that, uh, I would suggest gateway hardware. Um, this is things that let you get a taste of controlling robots and hardware and electronics with code in a much easier way than you would get from starting, starting from a, a raw Arduino board. Um, the most popular and probably exciting is the Parrot quadcopter. And I was going to bring one of these to demo, but it broke when I was testing it. And uh, pro tip, have spare parts on hand if you get one of these. Um, basically, it's about the size of a pizza box, and there's four propellers, and the computer inside keeps it level and balanced, and it uses, I don't know, sorcery. <laughs> there's there's a, a camera on the bottom that sees the ground, and there's an ultrasonic sensor that measures altitude and, or distance from the ground, and it uses the image from the ground camera to keep itself in one place to correct any drift that happens, and you control it from your smartphone. And it's very easy to connect to because it has a Wi-Fi router on board, so you just connect to it as Wi-Fi and then use an app to control it. Um, what makes it so, so hackable is that uh, the firmware on it is proprietary, but the protocol to speak to it is not. And they <coughs> have an SDK that lets you build against that, um, they kind of wanted people to make games, uh, but people who are into JavaScript hardware said, eh, let's just control it with code. So there's a library called, um, uh, is it drone cop? No. It's, it's a library for controlling AR drones using JavaScript. And it's this very simple JavaScript-y structure where you have commands like take off, land, um, rotate, flip, blink lights, things like that, and you can control it, you can tell it to do things. So I don't have the, the actual copter, but somebody made a Voxel.js implementation of 
the Parrot API, which is amazing enough in its own. So this is kind of what it looks like. So there's the, there's the drone on the ground. You can tell it to take off. Um, You can, where's my, where's my mouse? This is not as fun as the real copter would have been. Um, you can tell it to rotate. You can tell it to go up. Let's see what else can you do. You can make the lights blink. And you can make it flip different directions. Um, Did I mention that there's a JavaScript-based implementation of voxel physics? And even without the copter, this is amazing. Um, and then when you're done, you can just tell it to land. Ta-da. Um, so this has an API for controlling a helicopter, and we're software developers, and this is the internet. So of course, somebody connected a dance mat. <laughs> so they mapped input from the dance mat to do some of these pre-programmed uh, acrobatic moves. And here's some flips. not the whole song. <laughs> I mean, if you go find that video on, if you search YouTube for AR drone Gangnam Style, you will see and hear the whole song, but not here. Um, as I mentioned, the Sphero robot, in a lot of ways, this is a better uh, starter tool than the, than the Parrot because it's very forgiving because <laughs> It's this indestructible plastic shell. And I'm, I'm going to control it with my smartphone because I spent all the time on the quadcopter demo and don't think it didn't work. Um, come on. All right, I'm going to talk while this tries to connect. Um, this is cheaper. It's smaller. It's great for pets and kids because it's like magic. It's like a little hamster in there running around and you can change colors with it. And it also has an SDK and an API in a bunch of different languages where you can control it to roll, change colors, do pre-programmed animations. And uh, I play with this with my kids all the time. I'm scared to fly the, head, the quadcopter when they're in the same room because it's just, it's loud and it's got spinning blades and all right, so here we go. With this, you can change the color. You can, let's see, make sure I'm going the right way. You 
goes much faster than this, but I don't want to fall off the table. So uh, it's a lot easier to start with, and if you have an apartment or not a lot of space, it's much more flexible. And here's some example of the code in JavaScript to control a Sphero. So back to the original choice where you're looking at the real world versus the software world, um, bits versus atoms. What would you make if you were not limited by the browser or the computer screen? Um, what do you interact with daily that you could make smarter? You're going to start to see over the next few years uh, anything that's dumb and infuriating in your home is going to be replaced by something smart and awesome. Uh, early examples of this are like the Nest thermostat or your smartphones. Good grief. Does anybody actually, has anybody not stricken their brain of the memory of what phones were like 10 years ago? Um, what would you do if you could program the real world? What's some tangible object or process that you go through that you could make better by putting software smarts into it? You're only limited by your imagination. What will you make? Thank you. <laughs>